that you know that happened. It's a, it's a shame. Yeah. What could you possibly do to prevent it? Like get your special tickets made with your uh, with a, your own scan on it. <laughs> so, okay, we'll get started here. Thank you for that information, Joe. That's something we need to pay attention to. All right, welcome aboard, everybody. And uh, most of you know our co-host. Good evening there, Brittany. Hi, everyone. I got a question for you. You like coffee, I know, right? Yes. Yeah. So this uh, one guy went into the restaurant the other day and had breakfast, and he asked for his normal cup of coffee, and and he uh, tasted it and said, this tastes like mud. And the uh, waitress said, it should. It was ground this morning. Huh. So uh, anyway, I do have to, I'm going to embarrass Brittany here with this. I know I am, but Brittany came to Messiah University yesterday and and uh, did half of the lab time with uh, uh, a PowerPoint on glaciers, and the students did uh, actually really well uh, on, their, on their lab work with the glaciers. So Brittany, the, um, the uh, scores came back pretty good, so they must have been paying attention to you, and uh, yeah, you, you handled that really well. I could have actually gone home, and uh, nobody would have missed me or anything. So uh, thank you for doing that, Brittany. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I you I should've, you should've highly stayed, enjoyed it. <laughs> you should have stayed five minutes longer, though. When uh, when Pima came in, along with my brother, there were three other Pima people. And I asked the class, I said, before Pima gets started with their program, we're going to play a game. There's four guys lined up here. Up here. Which one is my brother? Oh, I so missed that. All, said, number one, number three, number two, you know. Only one out of the 16 people uh, guessed my my brother. But uh, I, made, I made a mistake by calling my brother old because uh, he's older than me. But uh, anyway, uh, that was a great program too, but uh, uh, you did a superb job. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. All right, so uh, we're going to move on here and get into our introduction. We have a real fun evening uh back for you tonight so the zoom rock room always sponsored by their architect in lake Havasu city arizona uh, they're going to be joining us uh, one of these couple Tuesdays coming up. I don't think they're in here tonight, but uh, Paul and Marcella Lair uh, having a great time uh, with their business in back to home in Arizona. So we appreciate their sponsorship. Uh, the Institute in Waynesboro, they're gearing up for a pretty busy year. And uh, this is a brand new flyer. Actually, I just got it in the mail today. Uh, what's going on in April uh, sort of thing and take notice to the uh, the second green area the geology rocks program uh, April 17th April 7th I'm sorry April 7th that's going to be at the Church of the Apostles UCC Church in uh, it's actually had a Waynesboro address I don't have the street with me right now uh, but uh, I'll be doing the uh, geology of eastern Pennsylvania which you actually have seen on zoom uh, some of Brittany's uh, material is included. And April 9th, I'm not sure how registration is going, but uh, we are doing a geology field trip of the Gettysburg Battlefield. Um, and actually, the hours are 9 to uh, 9 to nine to 4 o'clock. So uh, call the Institute or email them to see uh, if there's still room. It is going to be a limit of 10 cars uh, sort of thing. So. Uh, Anyway, there's the rest of their schedule if you care to uh, see what's going on or to, or to contact them. This part of the intro is being uh, recorded, so it's going to be on the recording. Uh, Dirtman, Mr. Andrew, Epic, 
always here. We're always with some great news. We got some great videos for uh, the Zoom Rock Room and uh, a lot of field reporting that he'll be getting into here in another uh, month. And he, in fact, he does have a report tonight to present to us. So I will hand it over to Andrew. Hey, everybody. <clears throat> How you doing? I have a good one for you all tonight. Uh, I can get. Yeah. Uh, so a few weeks ago, well, a month ago or so now, uh, went out to Delaware with a bunch of clubs to the CND Canal. Figured I'd film something, didn't know all that was about to happen. And uh, I once again, my theme of legends this year that I'm trying to focus on, I ran into a good one. Uh, so uh, I'm very excited about this one to share with you all. So let me just share my screen. Give me one second here. Everyone, please enjoy. Hey Rockhounds, Dirtman here again with another special report. Today, I'm in Delaware on the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal. Owned by the Army Corps of Engineers, this 14 mile long canal is one of the busiest and most high tech in the country. But you wouldn't be able to tell that today. Started in 1804, it took until about the 1970s to complete. Ben Franklin and Teddy Roosevelt both had key roles in this development but it was the hard work of 2,600 men that originally hand dug this canal. And today, I'm here to dig through the spoils piles that was dredged out of the canal long ago by the Army Corps of Engineers and dumped in this field. This is the Mount Laurel Formation. It's in the Cretaceous. So these fossils lived about 65 to 85 million years ago. Initially getting here, I was a little bit worried about what I might find, being that these spoils piles were dumped here in the 70s. But I've only made it about 200 feet along the road, and I've already filled my pockets with belemites. In fact, I wasn't able to go more than five feet without finding something. And some of these belemites actually glow in the sun, making them stand out against the sand. But there's also gastropods, many types of brachiopods. There's corals, and so much more. So as far as mineralization, You've got a lot of silica here, but what I'm also finding is some granite nice. Some really, really nice, nice. <laughs> I'm here with Central PA Rock and Mineral Club members, Ken and Mary, and we've been collecting for about a couple hours now. What have you guys found? Well, a bunch of uh, different shells, coral, coral, and then a whole bunch of the uh, Bellamites. Bellamites with the yeah, bellamite points. Spherons that are inside of the of the animal when it's alive. The bellamite is the state fossil for, for Delaware. So Corey, what you found so far? Everything. Found a screwdriver. <laughs> Some shells and bellamite. Lots of bellamites. I'm here with Gavin and Luke, and they're finding some really cool stuff here, so I figured I'd see what they're finding. What you guys finding? Well, so we got some uh, bun corals. Uh, we also got some sea urchins. Sea urchins. Very rare find here in Delaware, so that was pretty wow. cool. Yeah. Really? Do you um, have a an urchin with you? Yeah, yeah, I'll pull one? it out. And you've already got it wrapped up. Oh, and... you know, we're taking good care of these fossils. <laughs> you gotta be, be preserved, you know? So they are so... I mean, this is just... Oh, wow, that's really small. tiny. How did you even see that? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's the young eyes. But that's the bottom side of the sea urchin, and then if you flip it over, wow. there it is. So basically what this is, is like a, uh, the, a pinhead size of an urchin, but that is an urchin, and it looks good. That's very cool. You know it. <laughs> yeah. The best part about this giant sandbox full of fossils is that it's completely free. It's an open park. You can come here anytime and collect. However, it is a federal crime to sell any of the fossils here. My playtime in the big fossil sandbox yielded just about everything on the list, which I quickly identified using fossilguy.com. Like these bivalves and brachiopods easily found throughout the site. Also, these gastropods. And I even found my very own piece of sea urchin. Although I was truly shocked to find these rare, 
iridescent ammonite pieces. But there were a couple I found that I wasn't sure about, so I reached out to the legend himself for help. Jason Kowinski, the legendary fossil guy. It is an honor to meet it's you. It's a pleasure to meet you too, and uh, thanks for having me on your report. You're a teacher, a paleontology enthusiast. You and your fossils have been featured in over a dozen publications. You've contributed articles and specimens to museums, and your website has been a standard reference for both amateurs and professionals alike. A resource I personally have been using for many years. So let me just start out by saying, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I'm, I'm glad you can use the website. I'm glad everyone, you know, can use the website. So you were out at the Delaware Canal with me while I was filming this report. And I only found that out a couple days later due to your Facebook post. I found some stuff out there that I wasn't really sure about. So I was wondering if you could help identify that. Yeah, give it a shot. My wife, is determined that it is part of a dinosaur vertebra. I was thinking maybe it's the inside of a echinoderm uh, once the shell had gone away. What are your thoughts? I, yeah, I would love to go great. all Cope and Marsh Bone Wars on this thing and hope it's, you know, one of the famous dinosaurs, but you tell me. Uh, I think that's an undescribed triceratops from the site. It doesn't have the option. <laughs> Heart have attack. You know, <laughs> I'm thinking it's an invertebrate. Uh, I don't see any of the plate patterns like the exoskeleton from the kinoderm. Uh, so you might be right if it's just infilled, if like the sediment filled it in and then hardened it, and then the actual kinoderm reverted away so you have the inside. So it could be that. Um, it also looks like there's there's all kinds of weird shaped button corals there. So oh. um, I, I give it a 50 50 shot of like a weird kind of button coral or. Yeah, in an uh, infield echinoderm, like an internal cast. Yeah. Wow. Nice, nice finds. Very cool. Yeah, I've never found, not even like an ammonite fragment that you have. So, uh, yeah, you have me beat there. <laughs> wow. I'm honored. Well, I have to admit, my wife found those while I was <laughs> filming. <laughs> and my wife usually finds the good stuff too. I just sit back, just <laughs> lay back, have her find the stuff. So, you've run this website, fossilguy.com, for over 20 years now. Can you tell me some of the highlights, some of the, the really cool stories that you've experienced since then? Yeah, yeah. so um, I actually started a site to get my own fossils identified because there wasn't really much on the internet in 2000. But uh, one of my main things I enjoy over the past 20 years is finding stuff that's scientifically valuable and then getting that donated to the correct places. So I, I found a few, quite a few things that I um, have published on. One of the more uh, recent ones is uh, it's the northernmost occurrence of a brand new genus and species of Cretaceous angel shark. And this was uh, right from Big Brook, just a little vertebra. And actually, I have a cat. I made a cast of it before I donated it. I don't know if you can see it, but um, it doesn't really look like much. But uh, this is a brand new genus and species. It's called a Credo squantina americana. So that was uh, just amazing. last year. Another cool find just this summer um, as a little baculitis. I, you know, for the suture marks, um, I found one with the mouth still attached, uh, which is really, really rare. Wow. Um, so uh, around 2000, I don't know, 2000, 2001, like long time ago, when we we're just scouting up along the Kelver Cliffs, there with a friend and we're just walking, looking along the cliffs and there's a little tiny bone piece sticking out. And it was size of a dime. Like, like I, I have a picture on the website, it's just like the size of a dime. I feel it and it's really, really smooth. So I, hey, Paul, come over here, check this out. And we just scraped a little bit away and it, it was like you know, a little nub on the back of your skull. It was uh, that, so like, oh, we have a skull. So uh, we called the Calvert Marine Museum. Uh, they came out, excavated, and ended up being a squalodon skull. And that's a really rare type of Miocene whale. So they're unusual to find at the cliffs. Um, so I, you know, I got one of the skulls, which is on the Calvert Marine Museum collections. Wow, very important find. Yeah, yeah it, it adds to the knowledge of what the squalodon actually looked like once you get enough pieces of it. Wow, that's amazing. Well, Jason, the legendary fossil guy, Thanks for being on my Dirt Man's Report today. Well, thank you for uh, yeah having me on, and hopefully uh, in the future we can actually meet in person and we'll actually talk to each other. I'd love to meet you somewhere in a mine or a dig somewhere. That'd be great. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I'm Dirt Man, and that's my special report, bringing the geology to you from here in Delaware at the CND Canal. Back to you, Jerry. All right. I hope everyone was able to see that. All right. I am also very honored at this point to say that Jason Kowinski is here with us tonight and
being that the theme is what geologists do on vacation, he did something really cool last week, and here he is. Say hi and tell us about it. Hi everyone, it's uh, real nice to be here with you guys. I uh, uh, just took a trip to Spain last week, and uh, obviously you can't just drink sangria and have a paella and stuff if you're into fossils and that. So I always like to go to natural history museums. Uh, there's some really, really nice Victorian era museums in Europe that has just fascinating, uh, really, really world famous specimens. So I always make sure I hit the museums there. And obviously you gotta look for fossils too. So I went hiking and uh, just found some marine shells and stuff, but you have to do the fossil stuff if you're away, even on vacation. Awesome, <laughs> hell yeah. Well, welcome to the room and thanks for joining us and thanks for doing the Dirt Vans report for me. And uh, it's been an honor and just a pleasure to, to work with you and meet, meet you. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me here. All right, Jerry, back to you. <laughs> okay. Thanks to Andrew and Jason, and yeah, welcome aboard. And uh, I'm going to go down here to where I got to be. All right. Uh, that was great. I've used uh, I've used the fossil guy website a couple times, uh, num numerous times actually, and we hope to have Jason on board for a program here in the in the future once he gets his schedule worked out. Uh, thanks to the Crystal Grove uh, people. Uh, they are the ones that awarded the uh, presents from last week's geography, or actually the last uh, last uh, program we had for the. Uh, uh, U.S. National Geography all-time star quiz. So uh, everybody, I think, should have their prizes by now. So uh, Michael and Krista, they they gave us those prizes to give out. Uh, reminder: It's getting really close now. The uh, Franklin County Rock and Mineral Club show coming up May, March the 26th and 27th at their new location in downtown Chambersburg. We hope you, a lot of you can get out there and, and attend the show at this new location. Uh, other shows are coming up. Uh, if you want to go to Buffalo uh, next weekend, uh, along with the uh, Franklin County Club, there is a show at Philadelphia Mineralogical Society, actually in Plymouth Meeting. And uh, for note, April 23rd, it's the Super Dig 2022 at Sterling Hill at the uh, New Jersey Mining Museum. Um, one of the best times to go and get your fluorescent material. Uh, going on in April 30th and May 1st, the Brooks County Mineralogical Society has their world of gems and minerals at the Leesport Farmers Market Pavilion, uh, north of uh, north of Reading. And uh, not too early to remind you and put it on your schedule. September 25th and 26th, the Central Pennsylvania Rock and Mineral Club annual show uh, starting to come together. Uh, as far as Jones Geological Services are concerned, uh, uh, OLLI programs uh, coming up uh, are starting here in the spring. Uh, actually, March 22nd next week, anybody here in the York area wants to join the OLLI program at Penn State York. Uh, great, uh, a great, a um, great, say, program all together. Uh, we're going to do Geology of York County, April 7th, as I mentioned. We're at the Church of the Apostles, UCC Church, in the uh, Waynesboro area. Battlefield tour on April 9th. And back to OLLI, April 12th, uh, we're doing a, a general program just on earthquakes. Similar to what we did here, a couple of programs together ago. Uh, for our schedule, uh, our next one will be uh, April the 5th, and that's going to fall back on you folks, our members of the Zoom Rock Room. We're going to be sharing any of your geology memories. Uh, even Diane and Roger Geist that did the um, program uh, a couple of weeks ago about their cross country trip. It might have some more additions. April 19th, a short geologic history and mineral resources of South Mountain in the Frederick Valley area. Uh, we didn't confirm the next date yet with Paul, 
but uh, Paul Fegley wants to do a program about his soon to be released article in the Pennsylvania Geology Magazine. Keep your eye on, open for that because it's supposed to be out before our next program. So go online and look for Pennsylvania Geology. Uh, it was scheduled to be released in late March. And uh, we have some other, several other people who are on the hook, uh, just waiting for dates from them. So uh, I do have a announcement. Uh, we had an executive board meeting uh, for the Zoom Rock Room yesterday. And Brittany and I kind of uh, came up with the conclusion that based on the response that that uh, we got about the trip to Herkimer and with the price of gas going up and uh, some uh, other unknowns, we're going to uh, not do Herkimer in 2022. Uh, we are going to get together with, uh, with uh, Paul Fagley and we're going to uh, uh, plan a visit to the Greenwood Furnace where he just recently retired from after many years of service. Although he's going to stay, stay as a volunteer there and uh, such, but uh, we're going to come up with a, a date probably in June, uh, on a weekend that we all can get together and see each other again, very similar to what we did uh, at at uh, New Paris Quarry last fall and uh, the cave tour down below Chambersburg uh, last May. So that's our announcement for for that. So uh, we just feel it's not the best of interest right now to to do. You got anything you want to add, Brittany, before we start with our program program? Um, I see that Vicki put in the chat that the super dig is postponed. So I did hurry up and fact check that. And it is actually true. The super dig is postponed until further notice and the museum is closed indefinitely. Oh. Okay. So something must have went on down the, over there. Uh, maybe That's the, it. Just wanted to let you know. Maybe the fluorescent minerals took a vacation. I don't know. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, we're going to our program tonight. Is I want to add, I was just, I missed the beginning of your show. This is Ken. And I was on the phone with the point of contact at the Sterling Mineral Museum to set up a uh, our club only visit for the first or second week in October. So it, it looks like a go. And he said that they're just trying to decide when to open. It will be opening, but they're going to continue postponing until they determine the date. But we're going to do something in early October. Oh, okay. And that's with Central Pennsylvania Rock and Mineral Club. Yes. So, but we we may be able to add other people as long as there's liability insurance involved with it. So we'll have to figure that out. But Central PA is definitely going to get to go. And that's a great promotion for the club too. If you want to really go to to uh, get your fluorescent minerals, join the club and you can go on all their exciting field trips that are being planned. For yep. 2020. That way I didn't back. <laughs> yep. Thanks, okay. for that up Thanks for that update, Ken. Yep. All right. So our our program tonight is uh, what do geologists do in their time off? And uh, Steve Lindbergh is supposed to be joining us tonight. I I don't think I saw him. In my last scan of who's here. Uh, Paul Fagley is going to be joining. In. Uh, Je uh, Joe's going to be doing a couple of things, and uh, and of course our favorite Brittany has has some things. So I'm going to go first, just because uh, I need to eat my popcorn here fairly soon. Uh, so I need to get me done uh, so I can do that sort of thing. So um, I don't want to do that. So anyway, uh, other than rocks and stuff, what do we do? And I, do, I put this program together. I'm going to go through it pretty quickly because I have like 24 slides. Um, and uh, what I'm doing now and I, I did work for the county of York for 38 years, and nothing about that is, is even in here because I'm I'm uh, not doing that anymore. So anyway, moving on, uh, sort of thing. Uh, first of all, if you don't know me or my family, um, I am married to a minister. I, I, I thought that if there's one person who can really 
make my life uh, uh, better and corrected, <laughs> um, why not marry a minister? Uh, so uh, she's actually going to be retiring from her church where she is now in Dallastown, Pennsylvania, uh, at the end of May, after 39 years of, of ministry. And of course, uh, being a husband, I am involved in the church life in a number of different ways, uh, sort of thing. She also does preach to me at home. So she gets plenty of practice during the week before she goes to church Sunday. So, uh, <laughs> oh, well, so yeah, there, uh, there she is. She also, uh, she actually majored in, in music in college. So she's, uh, she can play the keyboards, uh, organ, piano, um, has a great voice sort of thing. And again, I put her first in my program because she is uh, first in my life. Although if she's sitting here watching the program, she's going to be shaking her head no, that she's not number one in my life. Another, me another member of our family is this girl named Tigger. And, uh, you know, we don't have any children uh, because I was never home uh, to be a father to anybody. So, um, Tigger is our latest uh, cat within the house, and of course she rules the, rules the, the the roost sort of thing. We do uh we do make, uh, some vacations, uh, pretty much one vacation a year, and uh, Cumberland Gap uh, is one uh, place that we've been to that's really needs to go back and see. I believe that's on the border of what Tennessee, uh, Kentucky, and uh, North Carolina. I believe that's it. A uh, beautiful spot though to go to. We've been to Tuggetnatic Falls in uh, New York State, amongst one of many places that we've been in New York State. There's a little story about this young man standing on the rock. Is that when we pulled into the parking lot to walk up to the falls about a half mile, uh, he had a sign by the parking lot saying "Geology Walk at 10 o'clock," and we were there like at 9:55. I said, I asked Lou Ann. I said, Do you want to go on the uh, you want to go on a geology walk? We we're going that way anyway, so we we went. We were actually the only two on the walk, and um, I didn't I didn't tell this young man, student from Ithaca you know, College, who I was until uh, a few minutes into the hike when I told him I was a geologist. He kind of took a deep swallow and kind of told himself, "I better say everything right tonight, everything right, or else uh, I might get yelled at." But he did fine. Uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, of course, um, tracking the uh, history of slate, as I love the slate heritage in uh, eastern United States. And so this is, uh, this is, of course, the major building in Williamsburg, one of the major buildings with the slate roof from uh, Virginia. Uh, of course, archaeology is happening around uh, Williamsburg, uh, a couple of different places when we were the last there. And... Um, we stopped in to see this dig, uh, obviously, and uh, I love archaeology, and I majored in uh, part of archaeology in college. And it turns out that this uh, young lady uh, was a student at Millersville University over in Lancaster County. So we talked for a little while about what was going on there and what the whole project was unveiling sort of thing. Uh, you might have been to uh, these... These two spots on the left is Maybury's Mill on the Blue Ridge Parkway in uh, Southern Virginia, not too far from the intersection with uh, Interstate 77 as you would head to uh, uh, Charlotte. Right, obviously, is Natural Bridge that we've used that in several of our programs uh, here in Virginia. I still love going to uh, Natural Bridge and taking the, uh, the walk uh, back through uh, Saltpeter Mine and the Disappearing Stream, the Waterfall sort of thing. And we love Disney World. We've been to Disney World a number of times in our 34 years of uh, marriage. And uh, I'm not sure what Luann's reacting to there, but uh, she poses for some good pictures occasionally. Uh, I had to show this picture. I hate roller coasters. And this was the uh, Splash Mountain. And uh, that was my goal for that certain visit was we're going to ride Splash Mountain. Well, you know, the day we picked it to do it, 
the high temperature that day in in Disney World was about 44 degrees. So uh, we did get wet, and the expression on my face, I just closed my eyes and said, here we go. Uh, Florida, anybody ever go to uh, Mucky Ducks uh, outside of uh, Fort Myers? On, uh, uh, there's a restaurant on the island, and uh, we went there with another couple who actually wintered in uh, Fort Myers. They, they knew the tricks of going to the restaurant. Uh, the uh, gentleman that we were with asked for a, uh, a table by the window. So they take us to the middle of the room and they wheel this window over to your table. So you get a table by the window. So, uh, uh, one of my other interests, and uh, it's kind of a, it's, it's kind of not taken off from being a geology, but I have always loved auto racing. And um, I have been going to the races since I've been a young person. And uh, I'm not a mechanic. Believe me, I can't uh, use wrenches very well. And some about 13 years ago, I was with a particular uh, 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 car owner of a race car. On, he, was, uh, he was on my, uh, my, my bus trip tour that, that day. And we got talking about racing, obviously. And, and he told me at that time, he said he didn't like the clay at Lincoln Speedway, which is here. And uh, why don't you go up there and show those guys what clay really looks like? I put a thought in my head. And uh, now for 13 years, I have become a clay consultant to uh, some racetracks. So uh, this is kind of what I look like uh, at the races with my headphones on. Uh, my goal is to uh, supply the tracks with a good clay that uh, doesn't get all ruddy. It's pretty smooth. Uh, does hold moisture. Uh, I do go onto the track in between the races and record the hardness and the moisture, so I can actually share that with the person that prepares the racetrack. And uh, these are sprint cars with the big wings on the on the uh, tops. You never have seen a sprint car at Lincoln Speedway, which is what this picture is. They go down the straightaways at about 120 miles an hour. And they're going through the turns at about 75 miles an hour. So we like to have a nice, safe racetrack, although they have some pretty big wrecks sometimes, and most of the time, it's not the blame of the clay. So these are the tracks I am working at for uh, 2022 at Lincoln and Abbottstown, Williams Grove and Mechanicsburg, Sillings Grove, uh, maps up in Newburytown, York County, Big Diamond in Minersville, and I just got hired uh, to work on the dust control at Bloomsburg Fair Speedway. So uh, my weekends are pretty much spent uh, going to one of these tracks, or maybe two tracks a weekend, depends on, on my schedule. So here's a, the clay. Uh, it comes out of a most of it comes out of an active quarry, and uh, I, I I check the clay. I test the clay every year for uh, different contents and properties to make sure it fits within my guidelines. It is screened, get uh, most of the rocks out of there, and then it's trucked to the racetrack. Uh, this is actually the Maps Speedway in uh, Northern York County. And, uh, and then I get the monitor and I get to go to the races free of charge, which is a, a great thing. Uh, Jones Geological Services, we've played a role in uh, creating some careers of some drivers. This is actually Dave Grube, his name. He has now moved into a sprint car uh, class. And his uh, first race cars were these micro sprints. So you can obviously see JG, JGS on the wings there. And now we're actually sponsoring uh, uh, another sprint car driver. His name is uh, Travis Scott. You really can't see the JGS logo, but it's kind of uh, here under the wing. Uh, we do a little bit, a little financial support for him and uh, sponsor his hero cards is what this is actually out of too. So if you go to the sprint car races, particularly at Lincoln and Williams Grove, uh, watch for the number five. He's a very talented uh, uh, young man and uh, we hope he gets his first win this year. Uh, we also sponsor a car down. It, it runs uh, actually all over Pennsylvania and uh, his home track is Winchester. Although that's going to be changing this year because he's traveling more. 
But uh, Levi Crow, you'll see the Jones Geological Services right here. And uh, we have worked with Levi, and we also got him the sponsorship. You can't see the whole name. It's called Drydeen Oil over here. That's a huge sponsorship. And uh, we working with Drydeen. Uh, they are now backing uh, Levi Crow. Uh, pretty good. So we got him that, that sponsorship, more or less. And I go to a NASCAR race maybe every year. I, I love going to Bristol, Tennessee, uh, because of uh, just the environment and everything. So if anybody ever wants to go to a NASCAR race, um, you can uh, email me and find out where I'm going to be going. And if you pay your way and my way, you can go with me. Okay, and I did take a ride in a a race car and a stock car, actually the Petty uh, Driving Experience. And they used to have the racetrack at Disney World. Uh, that track is now gone. But uh, my wife uh, gave me permission uh, to go and take a ride around the mile track at 140 miles an hour. So that was my only experience. So I'm getting a little tired sort of thing. Although I'm going to carry on with my astronomy. I do have a... Uh, I almost majored in astronomy when I went to college. The only problem was Catawba College did not have an astronomy major. So I did have to take geology. They did have an observatory, which I, uh, as a senior, I became in charge of. So when I retired from the county of York, I, I built this rule off uh, observatory sort of thing. It's a garden shed that uh, a company built for me. And it was designed such that the roof rolls off. And we're able to see uh, see the skies with my 10 inch Mead telescope. There it is. And obviously, uh, I called it Mount Jones Observatory. And uh, a friend of mine, actually, who was a graphic uh, artist, designed that for, for me to put by the door. So, on some clear nights when I'm available, uh, I'm out there observing the uh, wonders of the universe. And I do love going to um, Cape Kennedy. I said for many years when I retired from my real job, I was going to go and become a tour uh, leader at Cape Kennedy. That, of course, has not happened. But uh, my wife and I have been down for numerous launches. This is actually John Glenn went going up in the shuttle in 1998, where we had a, a NASA pass to get into one of the viewing areas. And I did a video. and, she, and I'm sorry, Lou Ann did the video and I did this, the still shots. So the last thing I'm involved in, I don't think it's going to work tonight, uh, is uh, it's called the York County, Pennsylvania Factory Whistle Concert. Uh, it is uh, played December 25th at 1215 a.m. This gentleman here on the right, uh, who is actually playing it with the uh, the stick, it's, it's on a, it's now on a air compressor uh, whistle, it used to be steam whistle. Uh, anyway, he plays it by turn, by moving the rod back and forth. The yardstick going across there has his notes on. He's looking at the music written for factory whistles, which is only written by him. And uh, many years I'm in there holding the rod down to let the air pass through the whistle so he can play it. So there, there actually is a committee in York uh, to keep this going. Don Ryan himself personally has been doing this uh, uh, solo and uh, with his father for about 75 years. And uh, it's been going on longer than that. It's regarded the world's large, uh, loudest uh, instrument. And if you ever come to York and want to hear this, it's a, uh, you know, it, it draws a big crowd in a, a nearby parking lot and instead of applauding at the end of each Christmas carol they blow their horns. So I'm going to end with uh, two of my jokes I found. That rock is not doing well because I think he'd stoned and the other one on the right side is for Brittany. My name is Stop That but sometimes they call me Get back here. So uh, I know Brittany has a love for dogs, and I'm going to send it over to her. I think she might have a joke about cats tonight. So uh, Brittany, go ahead. I'll get out of here. 
and you can take it away. All righty. I knew you were going to make me tell this joke. So why can cats not play poker in the jungle? Because there's too many cheetahs. <laughs> All righty. You learn from the best. That's right. <laughs> Alrighty. Alrighty. So when Jerry asked me to participate, I was kind of thinking, well, everyone knows I don't work as a geoscientist at the moment, but hey, we can still see what I do for fun. So I'm actually working as a chiropractic assistant right now. So super busy doing that, pretty long days. Luckily, I have Fridays off, so I actually get three-day weekends every week. You know that I help Jerry with Rock Room, and um, I do some stuff for his geological services, which I really appreciate and enjoy. You also know that I'm pretty active in the Central Pennsylvania Rock and Mineral Club. This year I'm serving as president and I'm also the editor of the newsletter. Like this. And there's Andrew. I seem to be frozen. There we go. So just to mention the show again, I'm probably gonna mention it several, several more times before September. So come out and join us this year. If anyone's interested in being a dealer, let me know. So of course, as a geologist, you definitely love to rock collect. I've been rock collecting since I was about nine years old when I was actually gifted a, starter rock collecting set and I have not stopped for well 30 years now. Went to the University of Toledo, got my bachelor's in environmental science, master's in geology. So rocks have pretty much been my life. I also like to do geocaching. I'm sure many of you have heard of this. It's kind of use um, Latin long to go out and find different items and you sign the log and it's really fun. It gets people outside. I prefer to go find the ones in the woods, but the ones that are in the city are actually uh, easier to find. I think I have over 700 finds last time I checked. It's something nowadays I do it more when I'm out traveling to new locations. I like to pick up a geocache along the way. I love to hike and travel with my dogs. They are my little sunshines. I call them my pudding pops. So we're always going out and about everywhere I go, they go. Some more pictures of them. <laughs> Professional hikers they are. <laughs> and they're also very good canoers. <laughs> And of course, when I'm out traveling, I definitely love national parks. They are, I think very highly of the national park system and believe that they need to be respected, which unfortunately many people do not respect them like they should. But here is um, Natural Bridge again, like Jerry had shown and Yellowstone Falls. This is the Grand Tetons. And I think this might actually be Baker's Cave that Jerry and I went to, I don't remember. And this is a state park along um, the coast in Connecticut. And I, of course, love this because I have so many rocks, they, I decorate with them. I am not a rock hoarder, I'm a curator of an ex extensive private geological collection. Something I also do while I'm traveling is I stop at every lighthouse I see. I will take the long way to stop and see a lighthouse. I eventually would love to put a photo album together of all the lighthouses that I've been to. 
<laughs> Something else I do while I'm out traveling is try to see new, see and identify new birds. These are a couple of my favorites. Um, if you saw my field camp talk, you heard me talk about the Harlequin ducks. These are actually West Coast ducks that will fly into areas like Yellowstone only pretty much during the month of May around that time period. And I happened to be in Yellowstone in May and had the privilege of seeing these beautiful ducks. And these over here, I took a whale watching trip in September in Maine. And that was quite the cold trip, but I got to see the North Atlantic puffin and some razorbills. So those were some birds I was pretty excited to see. And there is never a shortage of goofing off when I'm out and about. I probably could have did 10 slides on my silly pictures I love to take. <laughs> um, when I'm inside and I have some free time, I like to make soap that looks like different birthstones. That's what that is. And I also, when I'm really, really have nothing else to do, I will start digging into my ancestry, which I have spent quite a few, a lot of time over the last 10 years working on and very interesting stuff that I have found. Um, this is my great, great grandpa and grandma. And I just love this picture. This is actually just my grandma and my grandpa with my Aunt Pam. And this would be my dad's side of the family with my great grandmother here in the middle. And this is Sir William Shirley. He is my 16th time great grandfather. And he was the, what do they call it? No, I can't remember, but he was the gentleman who would take care of the queen's force. And he fathered 57 children. <laughs> so I think that's it. Yep. All right. So that's what I like to do for fun. That's a good life. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, I just still don't see Steve in the room. Uh, so we're going to pass it on over to Mr. Joseph. Want to take the screen or if you got your technology down. Can't hear you, Joe. You're muted. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Can you hear me now? We got Absolutely. Yeah. All right, last time I tried to do this, it bumped me out of the room and I had, had to log back in again. So, anyhow, um, I'm gonna try to switch screens and then uh, just kind of show you a little bit as to, you know, what, what maybe I, you know, doing my pastime and just like everybody else, you know, I, I do mineral collecting and, and uh, involved with charities in the church and stuff, but I decided just to try to do something a little different for the rock room that I do to pass some time as a hobby. So I'm going to share that with you if I can share this screen. So here, here we go. I wanna, here we go. Hmm. All right, you can see me, can't you? Everything good, good Jerry? Yep, you're good. Okay, so now I got to figure out how to switch the view to the other side. That didn't work. Okay. How do I... Let's see. You may not be able to, Joe. I guess I did. See, All see right, what cool. you made me do, <laughs> third man. <laughs> okay. All right. So let me uh, take you over. 
It's on a little, little fun hobby that I enjoy doing. Huh. So, electroplating. So I kind of put together a little electroplating uh, thing that I, I like to do for, uh, for uh, different aspects. And um, this is the electroplating setup that I have right here. And I actually put together a little, little demo. If you're not familiar with electroplating, it involves a, uh, an anode. In this, in this setup, I have two anodes, which are zinc and a cathode. The cathode is where you put your material to be plated. In the cathode, the material would hang right from this copper bar into the electroplating solution. And a current is passed from the machine to the electroplating solution, thus, you know, plating your, your product. I've been doing this now for, for quite a while. It's become to be a neat hobby. This is a zinc plating setup. I have a zinc setup here. I also have a copper setup, a flash copper setup, and a tin setup in some other aspects. But the, uh, this, the just the copper, the, the zinc plating alone is just I wanted to share with you today. And, and while I'm at it, I just want to point out this little bad boy right here. Uh, have you ever seen something like that, Jerry? That's a nice one. That's a, probably the, have you ever heard of a box fold? Yes. <laughs> That's as close as I think I'm ever going to come to owning a box fold or seeing a box fold <laughs> in this in this piece right here. I wanted to like to share that. That's the elusive, like I call it, the elusive box fold. That's actually a right angle right here. This comes up. That's, so it'd be nice if I had it all the way across, but uh, anyhow. Okay. So what I have is a couple pieces right here that have been set. They've already been prepped. And the pieces are just like this. And what we have to do is, is uh, when we do an electroplating, is you look at the size of the piece and put it up on a, uh, on a roller. It's two by two. So we have two square, four square inches on each side. On both sides, it's eight square inches. You do two pieces and it's 16 square inches. And for electroplating, there's a formula we use when we plate a piece. So we have two pieces, there's 16 square inches and 16 square inches times 0 0.14 amps per inch. That's the formula we use. What's that, about 2.25, 2.24? Somebody has a calculator, you can calculate that. And that's the amps that we want to set this current at for doing the solution. And uh, let's do a fire this up, turn, a, turn it on. So now I have current going through the solution, or not current, but the solution is flowing, the pump's running, the heater's on. So right now it's really good to have two hands to do this. So I'm just going to throw this in. I'm going to set the uh, transformer. Set current going, set the transformer at 2.24, turn it down to 2.24. I got a fine and a course adjustment. There you go. I say 25224, okay, close enough. And uh, before we put the piece in, we have to actually catch it first. Let me pull the top off of this. This is rinse water, deionized rinse water. This is 5% HCl acid etching solution. And um, I'm going to do those, those pieces at once. Usually I, I don't do this, but uh, one at a time, but for sake, I'm just going to do it this way. I rinse it off in the uh, DI water just to get the 
denatured alcohol off of it. It's been sitting in denatured. I prepped the piece today. Whenever you put it in denatured, you always have to make sure there's no water sitting on the metal because it will rust in the denatured alcohol because water is soluble in alcohol and it'll, the water will seek out it. So I put it in here and this etches it. As soon as it's etched, it needs to be etched to hold the uh, zinc plating. Take the acid off it, now it's etched. Take this thing out of here. I should have taken this out in the first place. And put it in the solution. So now I'm actually zinc plating right now those two pieces in this electric plating solution. The zinc is being supplied from this anode and this anode onto the product sitting in the bottom of the basin. Uh, the cathode is, is right here, and that's the cathode is actually the, the product that's being plated. Now, the whole time it takes for this to run is, is 15 to 20 minutes for that to run. And so I'm not going to really get involved with, uh, if, I'm, if it's still here, I can pull, pull them out and show them to you what it looks like when it pulls it out. But I have a couple pieces I have to I can go over and kind of show you. If uh, when you're doing electroplating, one thing you got to do is you got to be able to measure everything and you got to be able to do math because not every piece is square. Here are some pieces that have to get done that we have to do calculations on. And you can see there, how you know, you have to account for every square inch or every missing square piece of these. And this is where the, comp the calculation can get quite involved. So involved actually that uh, I actually wrote an Excel program on, on the computer just because it's so much easier to do some of the equations on the program. Here's some examples of some, when I was doing some pieces, some of the equations that are involved. It's simple math, but it, it actually has to be precise. We're doing each piece, the amount of math involved just to determine the square inch of the piece that you're doing <clears throat> has to be precise enough where you burn your piece and you have to do it again and again and again until you get it right. So this is just some of the math involved with uh, getting the square inches of the, uh, the piece. And Couple pieces that were done already. Now, this is a door hinge I had practice on. You can see it's burnt in the middle, but the outside came out okay on the edges. These pieces came out pretty nice. This is just practice pieces. It's got a nice iridescent look to them, which is really what I'm looking for. This is a nice, this is a fuel meter cover piece that I put a, a coating on. And again, it doesn't look at all like zinc. It's actually has, it's supposed to look a gray color. Like this setup I have here is a gray setup that's supposed to almost imitate a cadmium look on cars. And here is a fuel cover that's rusted that, now this is what has to get done next. Um, this is what it looks like before I prep it and put in the solution. This is what it looks like when it comes out. It has a different iridescent color, not quite shown because I don't want it shiny. Shiny is bad for this, a lot of these applications. Shiny looks good on some small pieces if that's what you're looking for, but that's not what I'm looking for. Here is a piece that was done. This is a shifter. This whole side on this piece, this whole bottom and all these pieces here were all done in the solution. And the amount of, again, the amount of math that's involved to determine that surface area so you don't burn anything is, is a little bit complex. If, after doing all the math, you can still see this one piece here. It didn't come out perfect, but it's enough, you know? So I've been doing that for, and it's quite, a, it's quite an art to get this down um, close. Here are some pieces of flash copper. I put flash copper on. If you're gonna do, Copper on metal, you had to flash it first and then do another coating of copper over top of that. And so that's uh, that's the uh, the electroplating. That's the 
that's what I love. That's I'll go back into the room now. That's still that's still cooking. That's going to go probably for another ten minutes, Jerry. And uh, what I'll do is I'll take that out and I'll show it to you. I guess when it's all done, you can take a look at it and I'll show you the two pieces. One's going to be an iridescent yellow and one's going to be an iridescent blue color. I want to put them so. And this is what they look like in a stock before I put them in there, these two. So these are like two control pieces. All right. Uh, so there you go. <laughs> that's, uh, rather, that's rather unique. Yes, sir. It's, it's uh, yeah, there's probably not, it's, it's not geology. Yes, you know, we said, what do you do in your spare time? Well, it's not, I don't, not geology. That's not, right. that doesn't account as spare time. <laughs> so oh, That's good. We'll come back to you at the end. We have a, uh another presenter or two waiting here so okay we'll, call, we'll, well, we'll see if i can transfer back now we'll, ch we'll check back in with you then uh you know. what's up we'll check back with you then at the end here okay i'm gonna see if i yep okay i don't know how to get out of this now there you go all right Mr. Paul Fagley, our newly retiree, uh, going to show us what he does in his spare time. Okay. <clears throat> Just a few things here. First off, what I want to do is this is goes back to the quiz last week. Um, one of the slides that Jerry had. Uh, I'm sorry for the quality of these. I, these are just a quick scan. Uh, he one of his slides was chimney rocks down in Virginia, and I was telling him I remember being there as a kid. That's me. the one picture and the two pictures. That's me when I was uh, 11 years old. That's my sister with me. Uh, Back at that time, you could actually walk up to them. Today, they have them fenced off. <clears throat> but there's a uh, there's a tunnel through the one. If you can see in the top left picture, you can kind of see that dark spot. That was a tunnel through the one. And then the two pictures on the right, I was telling Jerry there was an overlook above them. So this this these are pictures from the overlook and such. And then um, everybody bring a natural bridge. Hold a second here. There's from the same trip, uh, pictures of Natural Bridge back in 1973. But, uh, so I just threw them in there because of uh, last week. But anyway, um, one of the things I love to do is woodworking. Um, my father was a cabinet maker, a Finnish carpenter, and uh, used to do a lot of custom kitchens and such. And he taught me all of his skill, although I don't do it as a profession. I love to work in the shop. I know my shop is a real mess in there. It's I don't get to be in there a lot, but a couple of years ago, I built a couple of dressers for two of the um, kids we babysit. And these are the dressers making them. And uh, there's what they look like finished. And, um, but I, I really enjoy doing that. They, uh, and I have all the machinery, all the woodwork, all the wood all I basically had to buy was some of one plywood for the drawer bottoms and, uh, the handles and the varnish, but I had all the wood. This is Eastern Red Cedar. And uh, coming up here this summer, <clears throat> I got two more I have to build uh, for such. So uh, this is something I like to do. I love to go into the wood shop. Um, back when I was growing up, my um, father, he was unable to run around the yard and toss in a football. He had a muscular dystrophy, Shoko Marie tooth, and yet was able to do beautiful woodwork work as a contractor and such. Um, so, and so I never had a real love of sports. So instead of, you know, doing something like that, he was, I got old enough, he would take me to the shop. And so dad and I really connected to the shop and woodworking. And even when I go in there today, it doesn't feel empty to me. I feel his presence uh, when I'm in there. So that's one thing I love to do. Uh, this is another piece that I made. Um, <clears throat> the mirror on it was actually out of my grandparents' bathroom. And uh, it laid around for years, and I thought about what can I use it for. And I happened at the Greenwood. There was a tree that blew down up in the mansion, and I was allowed to take the wood home for Dad. And he never did anything with it. Um, 
but I thought this was a very pretty wood. Um, I won't take the time to guess, but I'll tell you, it's apple wood. This was an apple tree at the park that blew down. So it's a really a beautiful little cabinet. I use it to put my spices in. And uh, so I made that many years ago. Another thing I love to do is trains. Uh, I like to set up a layout of Christmas. This one was last Christmas. It's not as elaborate as I've done. I've, I've had as many as eight trains running underneath the tree. Uh, this year, I only got four of them set up. Um, but uh, pretty much everything is vintage. I really don't go into modern stuff. Uh, there's only one or two pieces here in modern. Pretty much all is vintage. And um, the next one here, this is, this is with the tree off to see what was everything there. <clears throat> um, the little houses that are these wooden houses, I'm saying these were my mother's from 1928. And uh, the train, you can't see it on it. Maybe it's on the other one. Yeah, it's this green train right here. That was her train. That's, that's my oldest train I have. It's an American Flyer from 1928. And uh, so I keep these all running and such. It's a mix of um, Marks, Lionel, and American Flyer. Uh, some of the buildings are, there's a couple plastic bill buildings on it and such like that. Um, two of these trains, the one back here, these were my uncles, uh, my father's half brother. He was killed in a car wreck when I was four months old and I was given his trains because he had no children to pass them to. So, uh, so I love to set this up. Uh, another big thing I do is this. Um, this is the historic embassy theater in Lewistown. Um, I am the president of the nonprofit group called Friends of the Embassy, which we are working to restore this theater. Um, the front and the outside's pretty much been done. Um, the marquee on it is a is a reproduction of the original. The original was just too badly rotted out. Um, it was galvanized metal and it was just in bad shape. So the new one's built out of aluminum, but it took a lot of research to try to make it look as it did back in 1927 when the theater opened. And um, you don't see it here, but it, uh, the lights actually animate on it. The sunbursts shoot rays out and of course got chase lights on it. And uh, I've been head of this project for uh, going on almost 30 years, I think. I took it over in 1993. It's, it's been a slow road. Um, we were all ready to start work last year uh, when the inflation crisis hit and blew our budget up. We're still trying to get the project back into a budget. Uh, this is some of the detail inside the theater. Uh, that's the stage, um, this tour out and such. But eventually, we'll be bringing this theater back. Um, so this is one of my things that I love to do. I've done a lot of research on it. Uh, another thing I do too is for the Boy Scouts, uh, I've been registered with them for over 50 years and I chair our local Klondike Derby. Um, if you don't know what it is, uh, if you can think of an Alaskan dog sled, um, that's the basic vehicle of the Derby as we call it. But instead of dogs pulling the sleds, the boys pull the sleds <laughs> and they go around the different stations. <clears throat> and test their scouting skills. Um, things like there's a cooking station, a first aid station. Um, sometimes there's a mystery campsite where they have to find mistakes in a campsite. Um, the image to the right there is the patch for this previous year. And in honor of my father in the 50th anniversary, that is my father on the patch. Um, so uh, I put him on there. He, <clears throat> my father chaired the Derby for 36 years before his passing. Uh, he took it over in 1974, not even knowing what a Klondike Derby was. And as I became old enough, I started to chair it with him. And um, so uh, I just recently did my 40th Derby. We shared 28 derbies as co-chairman. So he did 36, I've done 40 now. So between he and I, we've run this thing since 1974. And it's, it's a really fun activity. It's, it's a showcase program for the council uh, up here in the area. We run it at the Seven Mountain Scout Camp at the top of the Seven Mountains. Um, I do a lot of research, historical research um, and such. And I've been published several times within other publications. This is actually my first standalone book. Uh, it was a 
amusement park that was at Lewistown called Kishiko Quillis Park or Kish Park as we call it. Um, <clears throat> the park is still there, but it no longer has rides. Uh, but it was very beloved in the community. And many years ago, I kind of got the fire lit under me and I did this history book on it. I did it as a coffee table book with large pictures in it. I Sorry, I didn't uh, throw any more pictures in here of it, but uh, <clears throat> this took me about three years to write. Uh, a lot of people dug in their old photo albums to get pictures of it for me. And uh, so the, the book turned out to be 368 pages. I was figuring maybe it might be 100 when I started, but uh, and, uh, and I laid it out like a scrapbook. I wanted this to be a nice history of it because every time I talked to people, it was always, I remember, I remember, I remember. And that's why I called it Memories. And uh, in almost every page, and I think there's one or two pages that don't, but almost every page has a photograph on it. I did newspaper ads, tickets for dances, or maybe souvenirs that were sold to the park, something about the park. So you could look through it as a scrapbook like thing. And then the text is woven around the, um, the illustrations that are in it. Of course, one of my big skills is uh, I'm a collier. And that means that I'm a charcoal maker. Uh, I learned that this is my wife and I, I'm sorry, the picture's a little grainy. I just threw this in here in a hurry. Um, but uh, we dress up and I demonstrate how charcoal was made at the iron furnaces. Uh, it was a process that was done out in the mountains. So in a lot of areas around Pennsylvania, um, particularly if you have a charcoal iron furnace nearby, if you go up into the woods, you'll find these circular flat areas and that's where charcoal was made. And um, back, um, oh, in the beginning of my career, I went down to Hopewell Furnace and uh, learned how to make charcoal and have demonstrated it ever since. So I'm a master collier as it's called. And uh, <clears throat> it's, not a, um, it's not a thing that you can see in a hurry. As I say, it, it proceeds about the speed of sitting around watching paint dry. Um, <clears throat> I do a about a quarter of a quart of wood, and that takes about 24 hours to turn the charcoal. And once it's lit, that pile has to be tended round the clock. And that's what they did, the real colliers. And a real pit would take anywhere from 10 days to two weeks to turn the charcoal. And they were tending several of them. So the crew, they, they would rotate taking uh, sleep on it. So because uh, these are live fire. Uh, they're actually a smoldering pile and they so they have to be tended around the clock. So, um, but I usually get some volunteers to help with that. <clears throat> but uh, I remain on the site at the burn and I've done around several parks. A few years ago, I did one down at Cadoras uh, with, um, in honor of the Marianne Furnace. It was, I think it was around the year that the property there became part of the park. And uh, Wendy was down there at the time. She asked me to come down and we did a charcoal burn there. Um, in honor of the Mary Ann Furnace. So that's that's one of my unusual skills. So, so I kind of like, I like really like history and, um, and such like that. Uh, right now I'm gearing up to do some studying of uh, some of the Civilian Conservation Corps in Pennsylvania and in relation to state parks. It's a special project that uh, I'm working to do with state parks, uh, particularly the African-American story of the CCC camps and such. So, uh, so that's kind of what I do um, in my off time. Okay. That's a great report too, Paul. Thanks for your comments in chat if you have been watching. I haven't, yeah, that's still, yeah. Yep. We all do fun things. <clears throat> so, uh, um, I've been corresponding with uh, Steve Lindbergh. Apparently, we have some technical issues going on. That's why he's not yet in here. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, my last slide was supposed to have been the uh, factory uh, factory whistle plan. I'm going to try to do something like this to. Uh, oops. <laughs> That didn't work out. Um, let me get rid of this stuff. Uh, um,
give me a second here. I'm getting there. <laughs> I think. That's the uh, York, York, Pennsylvania factory uh, whistle. It's online. Uh, you can actually stream it uh, Christmas morning live. It has been around the world. So anyway, uh, let's check in here uh, with uh, with Joe again if he has his final product there. See, Paul, are you still are you still sharing the screen, Paul? <laughs> no, Jerry, I, I actually see you on my screen. Mine's totally minimized. Okay, I'm dark. Okay. All right, Joe, are you there? Yes. You want you have your final product there? Yeah, I actually just went and had to pull it out of solution. Let me uh, let me go grab it real quick. Okay. Well, I hope you realize that you know all these uh, these prof professionals have have other lives. We try to be, but as I tell people, geology is uh, geology is everywhere. So it's really hard to go where you won't see any geology. And uh, but uh, sometimes it's good just to get away from looking at rocks and uh, look at other fun stuff. Here's Joe. Okay, you there, Jerry? You're good. Okay, these are the two pieces that were just electroplated. I'm sure I have it too close. That's good. There we go. Yeah, find it. One one has an iridescent bluish tint to it, and that is this one. That's supposed to imitate a uh, an, an old time bluish tint that uh, that's a cadmium type of chronic plating. And this is an iridescent yellow tinting that's sometimes fine found on old Rochester carburetors and imitates that that yellow tints for say, re, re, uh, replating a carburetor and getting that yellow color back onto it. And that's what this yellow, this iridescent yellow was for. So that's the, that's two of the colors. You can see they're both different and I just put them in there because they were, they were treated differently when they came out uh, to give a different appearance for different effects for different applications. Okay, Ooh. that's all. Very good, okay. I do want to uh, make an announcement that my last Saturday's program at the Millersville 
Historical Society was canceled because of the snowstorm. Uh, so the uh, Millersville Historical Society, uh, I'm going to do the Mining History of Lancaster County, will be now September the 10th. For anybody in the Lancaster County area, or you want to come to Millersville the, uh, Historical Society, and that'll be the second Saturday of September. So I don't uh, don't see Stephen. Oh, there he is. Okay, Stephen is here. I hey, good good to see you there, young man. <laughs> uh, I'm, gonna hey, um, you, I'm gonna let you do your thing here then. Oh, um, are you ready for that or not? Well, I think I got my nights mixed up. I totally forgot that we had a Zoom tonight, and um, we actually just got back from Hawaii. So my my schedule has been so messed up. Um, so just to let the rest of the the room know, I emailed you, what did I email you about a half hour ago or an hour ago and said, "Is there a Zoom tonight?" Yeah. Or <laughs> yeah. I didn't see it until about seven fifteen. <laughs> no, that's fine. I forgot completely about it, and uh, I even. Um, I even uh, called Mike Bear over in Pittsburgh, and Mike said, "Oh no, there's no Zoom tonight." I, uh -oh. I never. <laughs> yeah, this what? Is the third, the third Zoom. So, so, what was your topic tonight? Vacation. Uh, what what do what do professionals do in their time off? Oh, geez. Well, it's it's all it's already eight twenty three. It's getting late. I I don't know. I could I I could run through something real quick. Um, if you got it, go ahead. You sure? Yeah, I got the room for a, you know, I I, I right. want to say two hours, so we have we have time. Okay, wait, let me just uh, close the door here. I hate to <laughs> I hate to have you get rushed in here and then throw you back out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think um while I was away, I just didn't have access to my email and I forgot completely about the uh, Zoom rock room tonight. So. Um, let me see. I actually have something here. I just guess just go ahead and share the screen. You can do it that way. Yep. Yeah. Let me um uh, give me one give me one second here. Uh, Maybe in our first first uh, April when you can uh, actually show some pictures of Hawaii. I thought I had. Uh, yeah, I can always prepare something from later on when. Uh, our next program will be uh, uh, geology places shared by the by the room members. So, oh, okay. When is that? Two weeks, right? Uh, it'll be the first. It'll be the first uh, Tuesday in April. Is that the second or something? All right. Uh, yeah, we have the next two weeks off. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, yeah, it'll be on April the, April fifth. Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry. I um. I I just uh. I forgot completely about it tonight, and I right. started doing other things to get ready for class tomorrow, and then I emailed you, and I even called uh, Mike Bear. So can you see my screen right there? Yes. All right. So I actually have it open as a PDF. So I'll go through this real quick. So, um, don't want to uh, uh, bore anyone, but so that the topic is what do we do when we're not doing geology, right? That's right. Okay. So um. Here's just a little preview. Uh, photograph on the um, left. This is this is doing geology. So this is um, this is one of our pit field trips. This is to the whalebacks over in Shimokin, um, up in the Anthracite District. This is a new enterprise stone and lime, um, uh, Loyal Hanna limestone quarry down in Somerset County. Uh, this is at the ice front, one of the glaciers in Iceland. Uh, this was back, I think, in 2016. And this was just last week. So I just got back uh, from Hawaii with 10 of our geology students. And uh, we traveled almost 800 miles across, back and forth across the big island of Hawaii. And uh, the, the highlight of the trip for me was uh, seeing the active lava in Kilauea Crater. So this was um, about eight o'clock at night. Uh, from a, a vantage point that overlooks the uh, lava pool at the bottom of the crater. So, but we're not supposed to do geology tonight. So here's um, here's just a quick preview. Here's uh, here's what I do when I'm when I'm not doing geology. I spend a lot of time with my family. Um, here we are. It's geology related, but uh, just to kind of fill you in. So there's me, uh, my wife Marilyn. I have two daughters, uh, Jesse 
and Amanda. This is Amanda's family, my son-in-law, Paul. Um, I have a grandson. Uh, Solomon is five years old, and this is our uh, granddaughter, but she's down here in the lower right. She's now two, and um, that's Amanda's family. Uh, Jesse's not married yet, but she lives in Pittsburgh and works. Uh, she's a bird veterinarian at the National Aviary in Pittsburgh. So here's Marilyn and I on the Johnstown Incline Plane uh, overlooking Johnstown. This was last, uh, that might have been right at the height. Uh, that was Christmas time of uh, 2020. So um, at the height of uh, uh, COVID, you can see we have our masks on. So um, one of the things I, I keep busy with when I'm not doing geology, my grandson Solomon loves Legos. He's into Legos uh, big time. So um, this is, uh, uh, we sit down and we just finished uh, last week, we just finished the Lego lunar module from Apollo 11, uh, which is was quite a large substantial model. So we enjoy building Legos. And then one of my, um, probably other than geology, my big passion is Civil War uh, history. I'm a huge Civil War buff. So was my dad. Um, I have a fairly substantial collection of Civil War artifacts. Uh, I try to get to as many battlefields as I can. Of course, uh, being in Johnstown, I'm about three and a half hours from Gettysburg. So um, I've probably been to Gettysburg, oh my goodness, maybe 20, 25 times. Um, I take my, take my students there um, at least once a year. So this was a picture on the left. That was the 150th anniversary. Um, can't see my face there, but that's walking, um, walking the field at Pickett's Charge. This is um, uh, one of the Union regiments that fought on the first day. This is McPherson Ridge, where Buford's Cavalry first engaged uh, the Confederates on the morning of July 1st. Um, here is the, uh, the viewpoint from the Confederate line, uh, Confederate Avenue, one of the, um, I believe that's a 24 pound uh, Napoleonic smoothbore uh, cannon. Uh, this is the Confederate line. Uh, this is looking towards the Union Center. Uh, that's the Kaduri Farm. And there's the Copse of Trees, which was the focal point for um, Pickett's Charge, which was actually uh, Longstreet's assault on the Union Center, the climax of the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, and uh, Jerry, I know you're taking a guided field trip to Gettysburg coming up, right? April 9th. Yeah, well, um, just so you know, Devil's Den and Little Round Top are now closed. I just found that out. The National Park Service is beginning an 18 month renovation and repair to Devil's Den and Little Round Top. So when you get there, those two places, I think you can walk around them, the Slaughter Pen Valley of Death and the roads are still open, but I think uh, Little Round Top's gonna be totally closed off. Um, I believe they're only doing Devil's Den first. Yeah, I think Devil's Den, you'll be able to see it, but I don't think you're gonna be able to climb on it. You can't get, you can't get there, but Little Round Top will be open. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Cause they're, they're supposed to start a pretty major uh, renovation. So, right. um, yeah. So civil war is one of my big passions. Uh, I was just there, um, this past fall, I brought students there and here's the famous, um, uh, here's the famous sharpshooter position down in devil's den with the st stack stone wall between the diabase outcrop. Here's a little round top in the background, uh, the New York monument. Um, it's kind of hard to see with the with the vegetation there. Uh, the interesting thing about this location, for those of you that aren't familiar with Gettysburg, is here's probably one of the most famous photographs taken during the Civil War. This is a Sullivan photograph. Uh, Sullivan worked for Matthew Brady, but then split off on his own. He arrived on the battlefield probably around July 5th or 6th, we believe. Um, and uh, they actually, uh, this was the famous Confederate sharpshooter. Uh, they actually found this body about 100 yards away from Devil's Den. He was in the famous triangular field and Sullivan's assistants put the body, the Confederate soldier on a blanket and dragged him into this position and propped him up uh, on the rock with the rifle. And then they took that famous photograph. So um, there's been a lot of research about this. Um, 
uh, some historians now even think that uh, Sullivan himself may have built the stone wall. It may not have been there during the actual battle. This may not have even been a, uh, a Civil War sniper's um, uh, location that they, they, they definitely staged the body. He admitted to that. But So I also do a lot of reading. I'm currently reading. Um, uh, I've just got these three books. I just finished this one, Twilight at Little Round Top. Excellent book. Um, I'm about halfway through this one, uh, which focuses on Devil's Den. And uh, I'm about to start this one, Pickett's Charge, The Last Attack at Gettysburg. Um, probably one of the more unusual things about Pickett's Charge uh, at Gettysburg is um, this is, if you ask someone about a famous charge during the Civil War, everybody remembers Pickett's Charge. Pickett's Charge is like the most famous, uh, one of the most famous events during the Civil War. But um, by far, this was a relatively small attack um, in terms of actual troops. Uh, Pickett's Charge only involved between 11 and 12,000 men. Uh, the, um, the, the attack on Little Round Top and Devil's Den on the second day uh, was probably twice that many men. Uh, Longstreet's uh, assault on the southern end of the battlefield. And back in 1862, at the Battle of Gaines Mills uh, during the Peninsula Campaign, when Lee became commander of the Confederate Army at the Battle of Gaines Mills, um, Lee released uh, 16 brigades against the Union line. And we think as many as 45,000 Confederates all engaged in one single attack against the Union line. Yet very few people kind of remember that charge. Uh, I have I, I collect a lot of Civil War items. Uh, some of these items I found myself on private land. Um, this is an original powder can um, from a Confederate uh, powder company that was located in Savannah. The uh, powder company was destroyed during Sherman's March. Uh, some bullet molds. This is an original CS Confederate States belt buckle uh, from a Confederate soldier. Uh, this is a Maynard carbine uh, brass round. Uh, this is a Burnside Sharps carbine round. Uh, these items right here, uh, the, that bullet and the brass buttons, I found at Harper's Ferry digging on uh, private property. So with permission of the landowner. So I've actually recovered a couple of items myself. I also collect Civil War artillery. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a five inch uh, case shot cannonball. These are half shells. I really enjoy uh, collecting the half shells. So this, these have been cut in half. So you're seeing the outside of a shell. This is a, and I'm going to show you what the interiors look like in the next view. This is a, a five inch round cannonball that was fired through a smooth bore um, cannon, like a Napoleonic. This is a, a three inch Hoskitch, uh, Hoskitch shell. Uh, fired from a three inch ordnance rifle, which was a Union cannon. It was the most uh, commonly used artillery field piece by the Union Army. Uh, this was an explosive shell. Uh, that's a lead sabot that grabbed the rifling in the can cannon. Um, this is a parrot shell. And here's what they look like uh, cut open. So the, um, the round cannonball, this had a timed fuse on it that was lit by the, uh, after the cannon round was, um, uh, after the cannonball was fired, this fuse would be lit. And uh, they actually developed a time fuse so that the, the fuse could be turned and it burned a trail of powder. And this could, uh, you could set the detonation for anything from one to five seconds, depending on when you wanted the round to explode. This is called a case shot. The cannonball was hollow. It was filled with yellow sulfur and this is the explosive charge in the middle. These are lead balls of different size. And uh, this is a Confederate round with the Borman fuse. And what would happen is this cannonball would, uh, this would explode. And these round balls, which are cut in half, would just um, decimate the troops if they uh, exploded this over their head or on the ground. Uh, this is a, a federal, a Union parrot shell. When you go to Gettysburg or another battlefield, uh, the parrot cannons are the ones that have that extra band of steel back at the breach. 
So um, this is about a seven inch, uh, three inch diameter parrot shell. It also has a fuse in it and it's explosive. The explosive charge was here in the center. And these are the lead balls or steel balls or whatever they could fill the uh, round with at the factory, whatever was available. Uh, this is the Hotchkiss shell. If you go to Gettysburg, the cannons that are at the high water mark that repelled Pickett's charge, Cushing's battery, um, they were three inch ordnance rifles. So the bore of the cannon was only three inches. So this is a relatively small round. This is the brass fuse. The explosive charge was here in the middle. This is the lead um, sabot that would grip the rifling in the cannon. And you could see the uh, steel and lead balls in here that would be the explosive charge. Uh, this was the most accurate round that the Union troops used during the Civil War. A good gunner, uh, they could put this round through a horse at a thousand yards. That's how accurate this round was. Uh, a good, a good cannon, um, a good cannon crew. So here's um, this is my uh, this is from Harper's Ferry. This is a complete Hotchkiss round. So um, it's been it's been disarmed. There's no longer any powder in it. But this is the complete round that was dug from the Harper's Ferry battlefield. It's a Federal three inch wrought iron from a three inch ordnance rifle. Um, so besides collecting Civil War things, uh, I also do a lot of miniature painting uh, in my spare time. So these are my little dioramas uh, that I make. Um, I I buy either the plastic or the lead soldiers and I glue them to a base and then I paint them up. So this is my, uh, these are my Confederates, little base right there. Here's, um, these are Union troops. And you can see there's my uh, thumb. This is about a three or four inch uh, wide piece of wood. So I'll, I'll mount the soldiers on like a, um, an epoxy base. I'll glue them down after I paint them. And then once they're glued down, I'll touch them up again. So I really have a passion for Civil War history um, and, and collecting Civil War items. Uh, here is uh, the largest one I've made. This, uh, I did this in the spring of COVID. So in the spring of 2020, when we were locked in the house. Um, so one of the largest boards that I made. So this is supposed to represent, uh, this is Lieutenant Alonzo Cushing is right there looking through the binoculars. Um, this is Cushing's battery of six cannon uh, that were at the angle to repulse Pickett's charge on the afternoon of July 3rd. Uh, Cushing himself was killed during the attack um, right after he fired the last round. His battery was actually overwhelmed by the Confederates when they closed uh, across the stone wall, but then they were uh, eventually captured or repulsed. So here's another view of that. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll paint the soldiers and glue them down. It's uh, something I enjoy doing as a pastime. Uh, and this one, that was a, that was a COVID um, uh, project. So besides doing soldiers, I also do little miniature dinosaurs. Um, these are some of my uh, dinosaurs mounted on uh, little boards with an epoxy base. Um, this is uh, Kentosaurus. Um, Ankylosaurus, uh, one of the uh, variations of Triceratops. And this is Borea pelta. Uh, this is the dinosaur that was found in the concretion up in um, Alberta, Canada, the famous um, mummified uh, Ankylosaur uh, genus of dinosaur. So um, besides that, um, there's a company south of Johnstown that is now being liquidated that was uh, known as Treasures of the Earth, uh, run by uh, Mike and Barbara Sinchak. Uh, Michael passed away about seven years ago. Uh, they were major um, uh, retail and wholesalers in rocks, minerals, fossils, and they specialized in making reproduction dinosaurs, and I became very good friends with them. And uh, Michael... Uh, the owner who had passed away taught me the uh, process of making reproduction dinosaurs. And I would, um, I would go there and uh, work and help them out. And uh, this is a cast of Coelophysis from the Ghost Ranch, I believe in New Mexico. So that's a full size, accurate reproduction of one of the first uh, true um, fossils that was the type um, holotype 
that defined a dinosaur. So at one time, Coelophysis um, from the late Triassic period was the type, the holotype that defined a dinosaur with the hollow bones and the open pelvic structure. The interesting thing about this fossil, this is cast in fiberglass. It's a mount that gets uh, placed on the wall. I actually made this one for myself and um, I have this as part of my collection. The interesting thing about this Coelophysis is that he has a smaller dinosaur in his stomach. Um, so when he died and was fossilized, he had just finished consuming a smaller reptile. Um, I don't think the identity of the reptile was ever recognized. Uh, this is the workshop at Treasures of the Earth. Uh, these are reproduction dimetrodons from the late Permian. They're actual size. Uh, they're three-dimensional models. They're cast in resin. Uh, we would cast these in molds and then paint them. Uh, this is a mosasaur on a flat wall plaque. Uh, those two Dimetrodon, these two Dimetrodon, uh, one of these went to the West Virginia Geological Survey and it's on display in their museum now. And the other one, uh, I'm not sure where the other one ended up, but we were um, working on finishing those. And so here's, um, I was painting and detailing the Dimetrodons. These are all cast in fiberglass. Uh, I still do this a lot on my spare time. I have a lot of molds here at home. Uh, these are, uh, casts, full-size hand-painted casts that I made of Archaeopteryx, uh, the famous feathered bird from the Solenhofen limestone in uh, Germany. This is, the, um, this is the classic one that everyone set, sees. This is the Berlin specimen of Archaeopteryx with the wings and the tail and the head bent back. Uh, this is Archaeopteryx eichstatt, another small Archaeopteryx, and this is the Apia Archaeopteryx London specimen. So uh, this plaque is about two feet uh, long, about 24 inches high and about, oh, maybe 18 inches wide. And these are cast in resin. Um, one of the largest uh, projects that we did that I assisted with, this is a juvenile T-Rex that was found in South Dakota back in the late 1990s. This is Tinker. Um, Tinker uh, was a relatively complete juvenile T-Rex. Uh, and of course, this is completely um, uh, reproduction. This is all cast in resin uh, and uh, mounted on a metal stand. And we made four or five of these. This is outside the company, south of Johnstown. Um, we made four or five of these and they were shipped all over the world to different museums. Uh, this is one that I'm getting ready to work on now. This was a, a leftover. This is a, an ichthyosaur, a marine reptile from the Jurassic period. This is a flat wall plaque. Um, so I, I'm kind of, this is currently down in my basement. I've got to finish this. I have to cut the flange off this and then this will be spray painted and detailed. Uh, and this, this will hang on the wall. I'll probably bring it into pit and um, hang it in the, in the classroom. So um, Civil War stuff, I, I do miniatures. Uh, I also collect, um, it's kind of related to geology, but I also collect uh, antique antique maps, publications. Uh, probably one of the best pieces I have in my collection. This is an original first edition, uh, Dinosaurs of North America. I remember uh, back in the fall, I did a program on the bone wars between Marsh and Cope. Well, this is an original Dinosaurs of North America by Marsh, by Othniel Marsh, and it's from 1896. Uh, it's one of his published books. It's about three or 400 pages, and it has all his lines, sketches, and drawings and descriptions of the dinosaurs he discovered. So this is Carnotaurus, um, discovered by Marsh. It also has, uh, this has Allosaurus in it, has Stegosaurus, uh, some, tricer uh, some uh, Triceratopsid dinosaurs. Um, so just another part of... Uh, my hobby. And then this might surprise some people. Um, I'm really into bonsai. So uh, I do a lot of, um, I do a lot of bonsai. These are currently in a greenhouse because uh, the weather's pretty severe here in Johnstown during the winter time. And if I leave them outside, uh, they get frostbitten, the pots crack. So uh, it's kind of hard to discern. Everything's clustered together here. Um, my son-in-law and daughter have a greenhouse uh, attached to their garage. So I move all the plants there during the wintertime. This is a Japanese black pine. Um, 
that pretty much keeps its needles year round when I put it in the greenhouse. And then this is a little forest planting of bonsai. Here's, um, this is a, uh, this is a, a Japanese, uh, that's a Zelkova elm that's in the process of being trained. Uh, I cut off the large stems. You can see the new growth is coming out now in the spring. And uh, this is a, a free form upright. Uh, this is a larch. A larch is a deciduous pine tree that uh, drops its needles when it gets cold. So this is uh, this growth just started coming out about two weeks ago. Um, and here's another here's another one. That's just a view of some of the smaller bonsai. Uh, and this is one that um, this is still wrapped in wire. So it's be, it's being trained to take on a certain shape. Uh, some of these branches will be trimmed and cut off and the tree is still in like a training pot. It hasn't been placed in a bonsai pot. So um, a lot of different interests. Uh, I also collect, um, uh, besides being really interested in the Civil War, I collect uh, mining items, um, uh, anything related to uh, coal mining in Western Pennsylvania, uh, miners lamps, safety lamps, carbide lamps, uh, old mining documents, blasting items. Uh, this is a this is um, a coal mining car that came out of a local coal mine here in the Johnstown area. Uh, the wheels and the track are uh, original, but the wood was so rotted, I rebuilt the car. And then um, I just put some of my mining, mining items on it as a display. Uh, this is a miner's safety lamp, uh, miner's canary cage, drills, uh, some carbide lamps. These are... Um, uh, these are uh, miners' candlesticks that date from the late 1800s. So this is probably around 1890, 19, 1900s. These are not really common east of the Mississippi. Uh, these were mainly used in the Western mines, the gold and silver mines out west. And uh, um, it's uh, simply a spike that held a candle. And the miners would drive this spike into the wooden beam in the mine and they would mine by candlelight. Uh, and it also had a, a hook on it, a curved hook. So this could be hung on a, um, uh, on a nail or a beam in the mine. So you can imagine being thousands of feet underground and mining by two or three, two or three candlelights. So here's, um, here's part of my mining lamp collection, uh, trying to get a photograph of it. These are, these are my uh, display cases here at the house I have down in the basement. Um, these are miners' bird cages. Here are some carbide lights that went on the helmet. Um, miners' candlesticks. There's some methane detectors in here and uh, little miniature items. Um, so uh, besides Civil War and Bunzai and uh, making the miniatures, I have a lot of other interests. And then um, sooner or later, I'll get around to organizing my collection. So this is part of my collection here at the house. Uh, these are my uh, display cases down in the basement. Um, but I pretty, I kind of have um, a little bit of everything. Um, uh, this is uh, petrified wood. This is a slice of cut and polished dinosaur bone. Uh, there's an ammonite in here. It's kind of hard to see everything. Uh, some large minerals down at the bottom. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but down here, this is a, it's an actual dinosaur egg, a hadrosaur egg. Uh, that I probably acquired about uh, 35 years ago. Um, little, there's a um, dinosaur skull right there mounted on a board, uh, some other assorted minerals and things. And here's some uh, different uh, samples. Uh, also in my collection, I tried to photograph some of my cases. This is, um, this is a vertebrae, um, actually a, a, a caudal, vertebrae from the very end of the tail of an Allosaurus. So this is from the Morrison formation. So that's an Allosaurus vertebrae, uh, caudal, uh, out near the end of the tail. This is a small dinosaur vertebrae. These are mammal vertebrae. Uh, here's a fossil crab from Italy that's been worked out of the rock. Um, and just some other things in here. Um, so I know it's geology related, but just, just part of my collection. Here's some Herkimer diamonds and pyrite crystals, and there's some other unusual things in here. So, so there you go, my, my uh, different interests and uh, uh, when, I'm, when I'm not doing actual geology. So, but um, 
it's kind of been a hectic week. Like I said, we just uh, we spent we spent last week in uh, the Big Island of Hawaii. We took ten of our geology. We had three professors go and uh, ten geology students. We had just an incredible time. So maybe if we have um, some time coming up uh, in the next couple of months, I can put together a little slide presentation, show you a little bit about um, the Hawaiian volcanoes. Uh, in, in one week, we drove about 800 miles. We, we pretty much drove every, we went to every volcano. The main island of Hawaii has five volcanoes. Um, and the one that's active right now is Kilauea. And uh, that's Kilauea in the background from a location vantage point called Devastation Point. So there was an active lava pool down at the bottom of the volcano. So there you go. Thanks for your time. So... <laughs> Managed to managed to squeeze that in. Appreciate your uh, patience to <laughs> get on here and. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry I was late, but uh, <laughs> it's been. Well, you weren't quite late. Yeah, I was just about ready to get sign off. <laughs> and, uh, you were there, so. All right. Well, we're getting. Uh, we we've kept you uh, all long enough tonight, and you got a good education. <laughs> a lot of different looks at what the pros do in their time off. So uh, I'm going to pass it on over to Brittany for her traditional. Good night, and we'll see you uh, in April. Brittany. All righty. Thanks, everyone. That was really fun. That was interesting. And yeah, don't forget, first week of April. So we're going to have two weeks off, and we'll see you all then. So everybody stay safe and have a good couple weeks. I'll make sure I write that down, and I won't forget this time. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thanks, Jerry. All right. Thanks. We'll see you, everybody. Yep. All right.